Boa noite, obrigado por ficar. Eu acho que hoje vimos um exemplo muito lindo de como a arte e a ciência podem ser misturados. Como vocês provavelmente sabem, nos tempos de Michelangelo, a arte e a ciência fizeram parte de uma mesma disciplina. Mas hoje em dia são dois mundos separados e bastante diferente, ou pelo menos pela nossa percepção. E o que o Gil criou hoje, acho que é uma é uma muito linda visualização, uma, uma comunicação da poesia, da, da estética e da, da arte que tem na ciência, que faz parte da ciência. Então quero agradecer você para isso. E agora vamos ouvir um pouco mais sobre a história atrás dessa peça do Quantum, e por isso eu vou primeiro apresentar a diretora do festival, do Panorama, a Anaíse Lopes, e ela vai hoje fazer a moderação desse painel. Obrigada. É, a Joia, vamos apresentar o contrário, né? A Joia está aqui porque esse projeto é uma parceria com a Swiss Next, que é um escritório suíço de promoção da cultura e da ciência suíças, e nós juntos programamos essa, esse projeto aqui, essa palestra hoje. E o Gil, dentro dessa turnê brasileira, com o apoio da Swiss Next, fez também o festival, é, o Fórum Internacional de Dança de Belo Horizonte, o FID, no último final de semana. Obrigada. Então, obrigada a todo mundo que ficou. É, o Gil Joban é um coreógrafo que já teve algumas vezes no Panorama. É um coreógrafo que acompanha o, o, o festival, acompanha o trabalho dele há muito tempo. É, nós vamos fazer uma conversa informal, basicamente. Eu vou falar em português, o Claudio vai falar em português e o Gil vai falar em inglês. Quem, tem, quem precisa de tradução para o inglês tem os, é, as pessoinhas lá e a nossa super tradutora que traduzirá tudo que o Gil é, disser. O Gil Jodan é um coreógrafo suíço, é, trabalha há muitos e muitos anos nessa, nesse lugar da coreografia é, muito especificamente interessada em questões de composição e movimento, e é, fez uma residência no CERN, no laboratório que fica em Genebra, que é o maior laboratório do mundo e é onde está o acelerador de partículas, lá, que vocês já devem ter visto é, na imprensa, onde foi descoberto o bóson de Higgs e tudo. Então, o Gide vai falar um pouco dessa experiência, de como ele foi convidado para esse projeto, é um projeto de arte no CERN, e ele vai explicar um pouco sobre isso. E o Claudio Lenz, nosso físico maravilhoso brasileiro, que vai falar um pouco também sobre o que ele viu do campo de trabalho dele nessa peça e como que essas relações entre arte e ciência, do ponto de vista da pesquisa, podem é, ser aproximadas. Né? Então, vou fazer primeiro uma pergunta, é uma pergunta para cada um e depois vocês perguntam para eles. Tem um microfone que está em algum lugar aí, para o pessoal da produção. Produção! Está a produção aí com o microfone em algum lugar, ali, produção. Então, está ali, ó, tem, tem os microfones para vocês é, perguntarem daqui a pouco. Então, vou começar com o Gil. Gil, o Gil fala português, tá, gente? Só que ele finge que não fala. Ele fala português, só. Ele fala português, tá? Então, é, eu queria que você falasse para nós, primeiro, como surgiu o convite de trabalhar no CERN e por que, que você aceitou, já que é um lugar que normalmente daria um certo, de, um certo medo de entrar para trabalhar, para criar um espetáculo de dança, a partir de descobertas científicas da área da física. O que, que fez você querer esse desafio de criar uma peça de dança a partir da física? So yes, uh, I live in Geneva and the CERN is uh, based in Geneva and like a good uh, Geneva person, uh, I mostly ignored what was going on in there. So I knew it was there, but uh, I didn't know exactly what they were doing. And uh, actually, uh, it was Carla Scaletti, the, the composer of the of the music of Quantum that introduced me to CERN because she came to work with me on another piece and uh, she organized the visit of CERN. And uh, for her it was like the thing to do because she's very much interested in particle physics. So I went with her and um, she started to introduce me to these, the, all those concepts that they're doing and the, you know, they're working like recreating the, 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 the moment of the Big Bang, very close from the Big Bang and all this, the, you know, the, what is matter and, and what is the universe and, and what comes from, where it's going. And, and I thought it was so beautiful and so, so fascinating. And just a few uh, uh, months later, I found out that there was this uh, new uh, uh, program for the Earth at CERN, called Collide at CERN, um, and, uh, which was brand new and was run by Ariane Cook. She's, a, she's a, uh, an English uh, uh, 
person. Uh, very good, actually. And uh, so she developed a, a, a policy for the art at CERN. And uh, funnily enough, they didn't have any policy for the art. So there was a, always a lot of uh, artists interested uh, to know about particle physics and what they're doing, but it was like not really organized. And uh, so she made this policy for the art, and they opened some residencies. So there was the first residency was Julius von Bismarck, and he's a German artist, and he's the one who did the lamps that you saw before. Uh, and then I was the second one, and I was the first choreographer also. So when I heard about this project, I thought, wow, well, that's amazing. So I applied, and uh, then I got it. And uh, th th so the residency consists of three months uh, in the lab, so they give you a little office. Um, and then you have uh, to meet uh, what they call induction days. So you have, you meet like for three, two or three days uh, a physicist, like a, such as Claudio, and they, they tell you about their research and what they do. And it's really mind blowing because it's very, very, very intense. And my level in physics was very, very low. So um, uh, I had to do a lot of catch up. So like for one month, I was kind of trying to catch up with what they were doing, understanding what they were doing. And then I started to, to do my to do my research. With, um, the theme of my research was uh, to search for movement generators in particle physics because uh, I I'm always looking for ways to generate movement. So I used to have this organically organized movement, which was made uh, by, is by decision taking. Um, but this then then I move on to the next level, which was which I call movement generators, and I use for a piece called Spider Galaxy, about 1,000 photos that were used to generate movement by the dancers, very precise choreographed movement. And then I thought, maybe in particle physics, I will find also some principles out of particle movements or particle interaction that I could uh, reuse to generate movement. And actually, uh, it was much more complicated than I thought, because in particle physics, a lot of things happen, but sometimes they last for not very much, or interaction are very short. So it was not so easy to find, um, and, and especially also the scale is just such a different scale and uh, such a different reality that almost uh, nothing is you can apply into our scale, which is the human scale where we live. You know, they, they really, we, you know, quantum physics is really what matter is made of, as what I am made of, what the table is made of, what you're made of, what the universe is made of. It's so like really, 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 really fundamental. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I started to get, then, but then inside the residency also I had to do a lecture at the beginning, then I had to do a lecture at the end, and in the middle I did some intervention in the labs. So I did one in the library, I did one in the Calcul Center, which is a huge server farm that they have, and one in the antimatter hall, um, which was just like, my idea was that I wanted to do things because I was bored in my little office and I didn't know what to do and I was like really getting really nervous with all those books I was reading. And I thought, okay, now let's do something. So I embedded those kind of characters that I called strangers and they were like beings that were there but maybe they would be invisible like on a, like on a different scale or a different uh, dimension. And um, like the idea of like, let's say that you have an aquarium and uh, if you want to get inside the aquarium, you have to go very slowly, and if you go very slowly, you're not going to disturb the environment. But if you jump, you're going to disturb everything. So I need to get like really slowly. So we were just going through, like we did like a three or four hours performance in the library, very quiet, very slow, and uh, some physicists working in the library, they didn't even notice that we were there actually, because they were so concentrated. Because CERN is like a place where there's a lot of concentrated people. Did you eventually find this generator? Oh, quer dizer, sorry. É, você encontrou esse gerador de movimento dentro do... De, que gerador de movimento você achou? Que forças físicas você achou para aplicar no seu trabalho coreográfico? Well, um, I did and I didn't. I mean, I found uh, a lot of different rules that I started to apply to movement. First, I realized that, uh, which is evident to my friend Claudio, but not to me, that all the four forces of nature, nature are non-contact forces. So for a dancer and a choreographer, it's quite interesting because that means that matter holds together without touching, uh, with, uh, with especially the electromagnetic force, which is really, really, really strong, that holds, the, holds us together, really. Um, then there is the gravity, which is the only force that we feel, but it's very, very weak, and 
so weak that I can lift my arm against the mass of the whole planet, so it's not a very strong force, and it's almost irrelevant, I think, at the quantum level, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there is the, the weak force and the strong force, so I, 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 I try to start to use this, so the, the question of you know putting people together, uh, also uh, without touching each other, so you probably noticed already right in the piece. They are also fields, like for instance, magnetic fields. So there is this moment at the beginning of the piece when they try to they try to touch each other, but they can because they would be both positively positively charged. So like like magnets, magnets cannot touch each other. So uh, or then I applied some fields, uh, like you know, like all the atoms of iron, say with the magnet, they would like kind of like most of them, like not all of them, but almost most of them go in the same direction. Um, then symmetries also. Uh, we used symmetries, then we used some Feynman's diagram to create interaction, but I had the help of physicists. So when I decided to do the piece, I invited two physicists to come in our lab, which is our dance studio, and they came uh, for a few sessions because I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was has some level of coherency uh, with the particle physics. <laughs> Achei um bocado de coisa no espetáculo, né? É extraordinário o que a mente do artista não cria a partir do, desse conhecimento de fundo. É, os tais os diagramas de Feynman, são, é muito bonita a coreografia do diagrama de Feynman. Se você imagina dois elétrons que vão colidir, eles trocam o chamado fóton virtual, que é do campo eletromagnético. E aí você vê os, 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 os dançarinos vêm e abrem assim, né? então é, você olha aquela dinâmica dos dançarinos vindo e de repente abrindo os braços e saindo um para lá e se você já viu o desenho do diagrama de Feynman, que é capaz até de mostrar aí nas transferências do, do Gil, é impressionante como você se relaciona com essa dinâmica, né? ao mesmo tempo que eu também não, não sei, a gente começa a ver mais coisa do que o autor criou, mas em certos momentos você vê os diagramas estáticos também na, no, no fundo. Né? Então, existe uma quantidade enorme desses diagramas de, de Feynman, das interações entre as partículas que você vê. A, a questão do campo magnético de orientação é, é espetacular, né? E tem uma hora que ele parece que são domínios magnéticos que vão, vão quebrando, né? E uma hora que os campos, é como se fosse, né? O, a, a gente tem em cada letra um magnetozinho, um imãzinho, e você aplicando o campo externo, você pode orientar esses ímãs, né? na mecânica quântica eles ficam precessando ao redor do campo magnético. Né? E aí, é, eu acho que o Gil também, ele se guiou por imagens de, de câmera de bolhas, que as partículas, por exemplo, vão perdendo energia no campo magnético e elas vão espiralando. E aí, você vê aquela representação das mãos dos coreógrafos, é, é espetacular, é extraordinário. É, uma coisa que eu acho interessante e que quando ele mostrou esse trabalho já em outros lugares as pessoas também têm muito esse feedback é uma sensação de visualizar uma coisa que todo mundo sabe que quem estudou ou que, que quem já viu escrito como mais ou menos as partículas funcionam você visualiza na sua cabeça mais ou menos né, aquele movimento mas são coisas que não estão lá você não consegue ver facilmente se você não tem acesso a uma, a uma, a uma fotografia é, subparticular então é muito interessante porque várias coisas que você já ouviu falar sobre o movimento das, das partículas, sobre as interações das forças, você consegue visualizar, é quase como se fosse uma, uma animação de física, né? uma física animada. E ao mesmo tempo, sem perder o caráter poético do trabalho do Gilles, que é um, tem uma poética de movimento muito especial, né? de, de, de presença cênica e tudo. É, vamos abrir para a plateia então fazer perguntas. Quem é que tem pergunta aí? Quem está com o microfone ali atrás, que eu não enxerguei? Pode, peraí, Cláudia, fala. É, o, o, o bóson de Higgs, que é esse, o campo de Higgs, que, digamos, veste as partículas e dá massa às partículas, o Gil estava no CERN quando anunciaram a descoberta do Higgs, né? É, é difícil você descrever como é que é esse mecanismo, a não ser pelas equações, são bastante complicadas. E ele coloca ali várias mãos vestindo a partícula né? e, e meio que criando uma inércia, né? criando uma massa a partícula. É, é fantástico essa visão. Temos perguntas, meu pessoal? Vamos lá. Então, um, eu gostaria de saber sobre o som uh, do Chile. How, how did you come up with the sound? 
how is it related to the CERN or to physics? Okay. Um, the sound is uh, by American composer Carla Scaletti. And uh, after this visit from CERN, uh, she told me that she was into sonification of data, which is uh, taking some raw data from the source and then making music out of it. And I said, oh, maybe we can find some data for you from CERN. Actually, I had a friend of a friend, and then very quickly I put her in contact with the physicist, and then she started to grab some uh, some uh, data from, uh, actually it was from Atlas where, where you were working. There was simulated data at first, and then uh, finally she got hold of uh, real data. And uh, so most of the music has been composed uh, using uh, data, which is really, the, the, oh, you know, because I think Claudio needs to explain us a little bit what is CERN and, and what they do. But basically, uh, there is this 27 kilometer ring, and they shoot protons on one way and on the other way at near speed of light. And they make collisions, and, and they have four detectors. And the, the collision, and they go through all those different matter and with magnetic field, and by this they can see. But they're like huge photo cameras. So they generate like huge amounts of data. So they have to store this data, they have to read this data, they have to select this data. So out of this part of this data, she used uh, to make, uh, uh, to sonify. Acho que ajuda esse Claudio a dar uma explicação bem rápida do que é o CERN e por que, que esses dados, o volume de dados que é criado lá. É, o CERN é o maior complexo de aceleradores de partículas do mundo e você acelera prótons em um acelerador linear, depois vai para um acelerador circular, são os ciclotrons, e, e, e depois esses prótons em alta energia injetam no chamado Large Hadron Collider, que é o, o grande colisionador, digamos assim, e eles vão em dois tubos de vácuo em altíssima velocidade, chega a 99,99% ,99 da velocidade da luz. E nesse momento eles fazem os prótons colidirem, um de frente para o outro. Essa é uma, uma imagem de um detetor do CERN. O que acontece nessa colisão, você tem tanta energia, que de energia você vai gerar um monte de partículas. É como se você estivesse voltando ao início do, da criação do universo onde aquela energia deu origem ao Big Bang e criou várias partículas. E, essas, e, e então sai essa chuva de partículas e radiação que passa por esses detetores enormes, também desse, desse, desse teatro, e esses detetores então detetam, tem campos magnéticos, detetam a radiação, as partículas, para saber a carga, a massa, a velocidade, etc. E é uma quantidade de dados absurda que é gerada lá. E esses dados são tantos dados que você não tem como armazená-los num único canto do mundo. E vários cientistas do mundo inteiro colaboram para interpretar esses dados e é, foi lá que foi inventada a World Wide Web, que é o WWW, que hoje todo mundo usa a internet, exatamente para poder haver essa troca de dados entre cientistas de vários países do mundo. A Carla Scaletti, que fez o, o som do Gilha, ela é muito conhecida do, da Nerdolândia. Eu que o pessoal que é nerd de verdade sabe quem é a Carla, porque a Carla, com o marido dela, inventou um sistema de geração de som que é muito usado em música e é muito usado em cinema, chama-se Kima. Então, várias bandas famosas usaram os seus discos, é, uma, é um processo de transformar outras informações que não são em som, que é basicamente o que foi feito no caso do, do espetáculo aqui. É, e ela é muito famosa também pelo, pelo uso no cinema, então a Pixar, por exemplo, usa esse, esse software dela, o Kima, e o, é, o, quando eu conheci a Carla, lá em Genebra, e eu perguntei para ela, enfim, falei para ela que era um sonho conhecê-la e tudo e tal, e ela, eu falei para ela se ela estava muito feliz de estar lá no CERN e ter feito um trabalho desse, que era o um trabalho que ela tinha mais orgulho. E ela falou que não, que o trabalho que ela tinha mais orgulho era a voz do Wally. <risos> que é uma fofura. Bom, outra pergunta. Eu. Cadê você? A direita. A direita, aqui. Oi. Boa noite, parabéns. É, eu gostaria de saber também do ponto de vista do diretor e dos dançarinos. É, havia uma necessidade no seu estilo de explicar o que, que eles estavam fazendo ou eles quererem compreender o que, se estava, o que eles estavam performando. Se isso é importante realmente para o seu espetáculo, a, a compreensão do dançarino de todos esses conceitos que você aprendeu. Sim. Bem, na verdade, minha presença, eu não estava 
Um, I just did some moments that I worked with one, one of my dancers, Susanna. I invited her to come to the um, and, and do some experiment in the studio around the idea of magnets and uh, the non-contact forces. Then I invited uh, uh, two other dancers to do the performances that we did uh, the intervention we did in the lab. So they were like more distant with the subject. Uh, you know, I'm not near being a physicist, but I was I studied it. You know. At Little by little, I grabbed the, the general idea. So I had to share the general idea. But you know, dancers they are very good because they are very uh, pragmatic in their practice, and um, also they they have this uh, very um, um, kind of intelligence of the body, and uh, they understand very quickly how to compose and how to generate uh, uh, things. So they, uh, in a way, the way I was working with them is like it's like an algorithm. It's like you know, an algorithm is, is a certain amount of condition that you give to computers, say between this 50 and 100, and this and that, and this and that, and then let's say you put a sound into it, and then the sound will kind of come out with, in a range of possibles, you know? So with the dancers, I kind of realized that I should do the same. And the, the, what is very good about dancers is that um, they can do maybes, they, can, they have their own talent when there is a lack in instruction, they invent. So they're much more intelligent than machines. So, um, the, uh, so I, I, I took the idea of algorithm and tried to give them the conditions, and then they would they start to produce material. And uh, one thing that was really interesting is that in the creation, because I was fascinated by the diagrams, the Feynman's diagram, which are really beautiful uh, drawings, but but also the, the, the he invented those diagrams. Uh, so he didn't have to make all the calculations. He's describing the, the interaction of, of particles, but without the calculation. So it's kind of somehow easy to do. Uh, and the physicists that came in the studio, we talked about the Feynman diagrams, and they say, oh, we use them every day, and it's really a tool that we use. It was invented, I think, in the 60s, maybe, or in the 50s. And um, he said, well, but we can teach you how to do it. And I say, yeah, really. So they, they started to, to, to teach the dancers how to draw their own diagrams. And funnily enough, the dancers, they, they got it really quickly, like even quicker than me. And, uh, I'm, and, and they really understood because to them it was really as useful as it was for the physicists because they could really kind of have a concrete relation to the, to the diagram because it, it describes an interaction, so we define interaction, say, okay, so you have a movement with the legs, and then when, when you have the interaction with another dancer, then you become you, you E positive, and you become E negative, or Y, or whatever. Uh, the diagram was saying they were becoming, and they would start to draw their diagrams, and uh, you, maybe you see, you saw in some photos when they're drawing on the floor, that's when they're doing the diagrams. And that's why really the, the physicist helped us because I wouldn't have been able to understand. I, I bought a book, How to draw, draw Your Diagrams. I didn't get it. But uh, they taught us, and it was quite simple. So and for the rest of the concept, I, at, at the end of the day, they don't uh, necessarily know about the physics. And I don't necessarily know about the physics, neither, by the way. Uh, but I understand the general idea, or understand the, the, you know, the, the, how useful it can be. Uh, you know, the question of the field, if you say, well, the, you know, there's this big a virtual magnet that is going over you, then you just follow it. You have to follow because there is, you know, there's this condition which is which is a field that is going around you, so you have just to follow it. Or we apply the, you know, maybe heat or cold to certain moments. So when it's hot, they go everywhere. Or when it's cold, they get, you know, get more one direction. You know, stuff like that. And they, they, yeah, they understand quite, quite quickly. Even though some didn't really get exactly the physics, but that's what I discovered is that. At first, I was very impressed by the, the, the you know, all those scientists that are so precise. You know, and I love this because they really, they're really precise in what they say. And I thought, oh, you know, we'll never be able to, to. But it's not really true because at the end of the day, you don't need to be so precise. You can just get like, the general idea of what they do, and then you know, it's like you open the door. And when I open the door, then you know, I got in, and now I'm, I'm kind of hooked and um, into this. Uh, yeah, physics, but not only physics, not just science in general. And I think the dancers too. Another question here? I was uh, very impressed by the lamps and how they were uh, mixed with the choreography. And I was also curious about, like, technically, how did you get them to, like, 
how do they work? Like, what's the mechanism? That okay, so I'm, I'm very glad you asked this question because I think it's a very important uh, part of the piece. Uh, um, so the lamps, uh, so this is this piece from Julius von Bismarck. He's this uh, a German visual artist. And he, did, he was resident before me, so that's the piece he realized, and that's the piece he presented in his last lecture. And when in his last lecture, it was already quite late, like really a few months after he finished. So I went to see his lecture, and I, he's, he presented this slide that were as an installation in a museum. And I saw the video, and I went to him, and I said, hey, wow, that's amazing. I mean, it would be great for a dance piece. And he said, yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah, of course, I always thought about it. And so I very quickly we agreed that uh, it could, um, um, go together. So I started to uh, produce and, and find the, the, you know, the necessary funds to you know, present the piece and, and create the piece and also build the new set of lights. So it is a very clever uh, system actually. It's very simple but very clever. So it's based on the pendulum principle. So there is four, each lamp has a motor and uh, there's this motor that is pulling uh, the, the, the string of, of, of the lamp, so it starts to give inertia and movement. Um, and those motors, they are connected uh, to a computer, and the computer has a video camera that is tracking the movement of the lamp, because there are some LED uh, captors on the lamp. So the, the, the camera is tracking the movement of the lamp, and it, go, it goes through an algorithm, a very complex algorithm that is uh, written by uh, Martin Schied, who is operating the light, and he's somewhere around here. And uh, he's the genius behind, uh, there's always, always a genius behind an artist somewhere uh, doing the real work. Uh, and uh, yeah, he, then he managed to have them synchronized. So with this system, the lamps start to be synchronized and then desynchronized because also he can vary the height. So by, by changing the height of the lamp, they, they, they go slower or faster and they start to desynchronize. And Julius, in the original piece, uh, he was interested in this desynchronization mo moment. That's, that's what he think is fascinating. Because you look at the lamp, and then they start to kind of get out of sync, and then they get back into sync. It was like, a, I think, a, a, a loop of about seven or eight minutes originally. But then when we brought it for the piece, then he, he, he wanted to do more movement. And uh, because there's the dancer under, so there's, you don't, you're not only watching at the lamp, so there's is a different tension. And it's a, it's a great uh, piece because at first I thought it was going to be very complicated to set up, very complicated to travel. Uh, we started, uh, because we created the piece in CMS, which is, uh, which is one of the experiments in CERN. It's a huge, and uh, nice as you saw it. It's a huge industrial hall. It's like 25 meter high. So it was, I thought, you know, we couldn't do on a normal stage. But then it, it has proven to be very, very flexible. And this is a very, very clever system. And Martin, uh, the, the, the engineer and operator, he, and, and with the help also of our technical director, Marie, they, they really upgraded the system. And now it has become a really nice, durable piece. Um, and we have like a few suitcases, like quite, well, quite many suitcases to carry it around, but we can really travel with it. And so it, we have very different heights. We, had, uh, we perform in New York with the, the audience around. So we have different configurations that we can do. It's, a, it's really a very clever system. And I think it's very important for the piece. OK, Mice. OK. Tem mais alguém aqui? Não fica quando estou chegando muito bem. A gente tem uma luz de frente aqui. OK. Joia quer fazer uma pergunta? Um, só mais geralmente, estava interessada de saber mais, tanto do Cláudio como do Gil, quais são as formas de pensar de um artista e de um físico, como que eles, quais são as similaridades, o que um pode aprender do outro, qual é tipo a, o benefício de uma, de uma tal residência para você como pessoa, como artista, uh, para o futuro, não só para essa peça. Well, for me, uh, I learned many things. Not only, not only scientist things. Uh, I learned at first that scientists are very passionate people, very humans. I thought I was going to go into like a geeky world of boring, you know, math people. And no, they're very lively and they're very passionate about what they do. They're as passionate as we are, artists. Uh, so I was really happy to be around them and uh, also, they're very pragmatic, and uh, you know they don't have this kind of mumbo jumbo, new agey kind of 
<laughs> way to think. They're very precise. The number, they know their numbers. They, they and they're very. They like to learn. So I learned. I think I learned to learn. Um, and then, yeah, they have. I don't know. Is 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 some? I mean, you have many different. Of course, there are fifteen thousand working people working in CERN. There's about five or six thousand physicists, but there's also a lot of engineers. There's and then you have theoretical physicists, and then you have the, the experimentalists. There are two different kinds. Some predict, you know, the idea like uh, uh, Higgs, Mr. Higgs. He predicted the Higgs boson in 1964, and he discovered it only uh, uh, 48 years later. And I was born in 1964, actually. So it took like my lifetime to confirm his prediction. So it's, it's, uh, they are very patient. They do fundamental research only. Um, and for us as artists, I think we don't do enough fundamental research. It was the first time I had the opportunity to really search without having to produce anything else than ideas. Um, we always squeeze this part. You know, it's mixed in the production. Um, there was this uh, physicist, one, he, did, he was doing a visit when we were doing the CMS thing and uh, to the general audience and someone asked him, he said, ah, but you physicists, do you always find what you're looking for? And he said, well, if we would find what we would be looking for, we'd be, we wouldn't be uh, scientists, we would be producers. <laughs> and uh, I thought, wow, that's really interesting because I think we have exactly the same problems as artists. If we don't search enough, then we become producer of a preconceived idea with the goal of producing a something that you're going to sell to the audience. And uh, I think it's very important to stay in the fundamental research and to develop uh, this thinking. And also, you know, they can do like 20 years and maybe they get, you know, they realize that, you know, string theory, for instance, is not <coughs> as they thought it would be, but maybe it's very useful, you know. It, it's, that's, that's really what I got. And also, very interesting in CERN is that they call themselves a collaboration. So they collaborate. It's not, so it's a very kind of uh, flat way to share the, uh, the decision, decision taking. They are very slow at taking decisions. And um, they go around, everybody has to, and they have to agree, like all together. So it's, yeah, they have many interesting ways. And also one of, of the big boss of the CMS, he said to me, Austin Ball, he said, Oh, I say, what did, what did you get out of us? And he said, Oh, well, for us, I was not too convinced that you were in time, my lab, really disturbing for three weeks. And, uh, but we were happy because finally we understood what you were doing, and uh, also we don't have deadlines. So, first it was good because we had a deadline. And I said, You don't have deadlines? He said, No, we don't have deadlines. We do fundamental research. We only publish when we're ready. And I thought, Wow, that's also something we can learn as artists, you know, to be like a bit more patient with our research and, and not always, you know, publish too early in our research. É, tem tem uma, uma diferença grande de ciência e arte, e, e acho que o, o Gil é um dos primeiros artistas que eu conheço que emprega tanto um, um algoritmo, isso foi uma coisa muito, foi uma surpresa para mim ver que uma parte dessa dança aqui não foi bem ensaiada, na verdade eram regras e os dançarinos usam as regras durante a a, a, a cena, né? Pra, pra... Isso é uma coisa muito bacana. Mas existe uma diferença grande na ciência, que é o nosso rigor quando ele é testado pela natureza. Quer dizer, a gente pode fazer teorias, modelos, é, ideologias, seja lá o que for, mas no final da história você vai e pergunta à natureza, vem cá, isso aqui está de acordo com o que eu pensei, com o meu modelo? E se não tiver aquilo não serve. Então, a, a, a ciência ela tem é diferente da arte, a arte é mais poesia. E se você fizer algo um pouquinho diferente, aquilo é bonito, aquilo tem, né, tem beleza. E, mas a ciência ela tem que ter, muitas pessoas seguiam pela beleza, mas ela tem que satisfazer ao que a natureza está te respondendo de volta. Quer dizer, tem que estar tá de acordo com o que a natureza está te dizendo. Então, essa eterna busca de criação de modelos, que é a parte mais teórica, né? e medidas experimentais, e que às vezes as medidas experimentais vão contra todos os modelos que você tinha. Você não, não tinha imaginado aquele resultado, e aí você consegue descobrir uma coisa completamente nova, e nem tem modelo para isso ainda, isso aconteceu várias vezes na física, ou em algumas vezes 
é, pessoas geniais, como Einstein, como Feynman, vieram com modelos e você vai depois, como, como Higgs, né? e, e vai prever e você passa anos construindo equipamento para verificar aquilo. Então, existe essa diferença, que é o rigor da, da, da natureza de dizer se você está indo no caminho certo ou não. Temos mais uma perguntinha lá atrás. Alô? Oi. É, eu tenho duas perguntas, uma para o Cláudio e outra para o Gil. É, Cláudio, eu queria saber da sua experiência pessoal, como você se sentiu como físico, porque eu acho que deve ter uma diferença para alguém que entende mais profundamente do que a maioria das pessoas. Você assistiu uma peça que valoriza a ciência dessa maneira, de, que não é tão comum. Quais foram as suas sensações e se isso é comum para você? É, então, Gil, eu queria saber é, se no momento em que você... Porque assistindo a peça, é possível perceber que existem Ainda que os, os bailarinos estejam representando partículas, existem é, características individuais deles, inclusive o conjunto de, de altura deles é, trabalha junto na coreografia. Se você pensou nisso como uma introdução junto com a questão científica, ou se em algum momento você percebeu alguma coisa na ciência que era é, mais única, mais humana, e introduziu isso dessa maneira é, na diferença entre os bailarinos, que um é alto, outro é mais baixo, porque eles não são todos iguais como partidos seriam. Eu vou então responder a primeira parte. Eu fiquei maravilhado. Eu, eu realmente fiquei maravilhado com é, a representação que ele fez da ciência que a gente conhece. E, e, como ele já disse várias vezes em entrevistas, em conversas, ele não quer ensinar física com, com, com a dança. É uma representação, é uma... Né? E eu fiquei simplesmente assim, eu ficava né, o tempo todo vendo aquelas coisas e dizendo, olha que bacana, que legal. Realmente é, é, é espetacular. I tried to, I mean, my interest was not uh, to be illustrative. Uh, I didn't want to illustrate science. So that was one of the first things I decided that that was not the point. There was, I don't think there's any interest and there is sometimes a big confusion with arts and science project. I don't think art should serve science or science should, should serve art. Um, what I was looking for was movement generators that rules that I can give to the dancer and then they can start to generate their own movement. Um, what I was very happy with particle physics is that it's so abstract. I didn't have to find any specific theme. I just had to you know, try to develop the system and just put them together in a very, uh, very freely. And um, the dancers, they represent something else. They, they represent themselves. Um, and I, like always in my work, and I think in many uh, contemporary dance pieces, they just represent themselves. They're not a character, they're not performing. They're just, they're just being themselves on stage, doing what they do. I believe that You know, I like task-based, I like, I like them to be working on stage and thinking on stage. And uh, to me, the, the particle physics world was only to generate movement. And the, the reality of what you see is, is humans interacting. And uh, you can project yourself into the interaction. So in this case, of course, I called it quantum and now we're talking about it. And, but the world project, sometimes the piece just like, you know, without much explanation and I think It's just a piece about movement, it's a very abstract piece. There's also some other elements uh, inside the piece that may be less evident, but uh, maybe in terms of the aesthetic, because there is an aesthetic also to particle physics somehow, um, but to me it was more like a like 60s, 70s aesthetic, uh, because we are, that's the atomic age, and we are all sons of uh, the atomic age. I think, and when you're in CERN, you, you feel this kind of old building, kind of old era, and it is super modern um, equipment. So I think for, to me it's a piece about memory also. And uh, you know, I spoke briefly about Higgs, but I was there, I was lucky enough to be there when they announced it, and it was crazy because there was all those journalists and all those people around, it was like massive. And I was, you know, I sneaked into the press conference, and I took some photos, and. Uh, And uh, Higgs, he was, I mean, he's 89, I think now. He's, he's, he has the same age of my mother. And he made the prediction when I was born. So there was a lot of, it was a very emotional moment as well. When, when they announced it, it was really beautiful. It was really kind of, and he was uh, emotional. And, and people around him were emotional. So 
th th there's also this kind of idea of memory, and to me, memory also, if, which I think was the 60s and the 70s, also the, all the postmodern dance, to me, is my background, is, is, is what I, I refer to somehow, that's what I've seen, that's how I, I develop looking at this, these, those choreographers. So I kind of let this memory freely uh, you know, go through me, and I didn't uh, make any censorship of myself, or you say, oh no, this is too postmodern, or too. I just let, you know, oh, that's, so I work on different elements, like working on the mechanic, I let, you know, just things just come out as they were. And uh, I think it's really about human interaction, really. Um, because they're human, they are the concrete element in the piece, and you can relate to them because they are humans. Lá atrás tem uma pergunta. Bem, eu não sei se eu vou conseguir tor é, tornar essa pergunta uma coisa objetiva, nem sei se vocês vão conseguir entender, assim, que eu estou até agora tentando objetificar ela aqui, mas assim, é o seguinte, assim, é, é, é a pergunta sobre a concepção do espetáculo, é porque observando como as coisas se dão, já sabendo o que rolaria aqui, o que aconteceria aqui, a gente pensa que as partículas, de uma certa maneira, elas nos remetem a algo arbitrário, ou seja, os elétrons, os átomos, eles se comportam de uma, de uma maneira arbitrária com a natureza, de uma certa maneira. Nós não temos acesso a algo que não seja, é, a algo que seja subjetivo nesse mundo. É tudo muito técnico, né? tudo pouco acessível. E pensar que tu podes dar subjetividade a isso, ou seja, que tu podes é, retirar dessa arbitrariedade e levar intencionalidade a esse movimento é uma coisa que... Que, que, que me deixa bastante instigado, assim, especialmente porque eu consigo ver e notar, é, por conta dessa transferência de uma escala atômica para uma escala humana, é, essa mudança do arbitrário para o intencional. Né? E aí eu começo a pensar devagar, talvez tu já tenhas respondido isso na pergunta anterior, e, é, alguns fragmentos me remetem a, a essa pergunta que eu faria, mas é, de ver esses, esses bailarinos e ao mesmo tempo imaginar eles um movimento de elétrons e de partículas que estão se chocando e que estão criando esse movimento objetivo, mas ao mesmo tempo de vê-los é, é, de vê-los de uma forma completamente subjetiva e de talvez de se projetar neles, né? Porque aí a gente vê nesse movimento grupal ou em duplas, como foi concebido ao longo do espetáculo, uma forma talvez de, de, de expressão das relações humanas. E a gente começa a pensar, pô, aí tem sensações, tem sentimentos, então quando eu vejo bailarinos repetindo o mesmo movimento, eu começo a pensar que eles não são só partículas em sincronia, mas que eles são seres humanos meio que é, interpelados ou tocados pelo outro, assim como é a própria vida é. Então, na realidade, eu pergunto só sobre isso, assim, como é que tu vê essa intencionalidade na arbitrariedade, né? o intencional na arbitrária? Yes. Um, how can I put it? It's a, uh, it's a question of scale, really. Uh, you know, particle physics, nobody has ever seen, because it's beyond visible. So you cannot see. You can only uh, trans make transcription of something through data, through images, through sound sonification, for instance. You can listen to data. But you cannot see. I mean, there's nothing to be seen. It's beyond visible. It's so, 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 so small. So I don't think you have ever seen. I mean, he, you know, Claudio can maybe explain what he's working on. I think it's quite interesting. But I don't think you have seen your anti uh, uh, I, uh, hydrogen at, uh, particles. No, no, no. We, we, we see the, the signal from its annihilation. When it annihilates, we see a signal from it. But, it, it, disculpe, se, se eu puder adicionar. É, o mundo lá microscópico, apesar dele... Hoje a gente sabe que o vácuo é cheio de movimento, de energia, quer dizer, a física é um campo rico para quem quer fazer arte sobre essas imagens, né? É, mas ele não é arbitrário. As, a mecânica quântica que prevê as probabilidades, ele é probabilístico, mas ele não é arbitrário porque ele tem regras bem definidas de como a probabilidade evolui. Isso aqui é uma coisa engraçada. E aí, quando você vai botando mais e mais partículas e vindo para a escala macro, aí ele, ele vai se tornando mais previsível, mais clássico. Mas isso sai naturalmente da ciência, sai de probabilidades para algo mais clássico, quando muda de escala, como o Gil estava falando. Quando você tem a sonificação, você tem 
you choose the sound or you choose the process to, for the sound. So, of course, there is a one moment that there is a decision that is made in, 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 in between. And that's, that's why I think I come as an artist. Uh, of course, it's not a description of reality. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mechanic. I was looking, I was interested in the mechanic of what's happening. You know, there is like, you can see some really beautiful uh, animation of, of particles. Um, and how they behave and how they, you know, how they move around each other. So there's a lot of rules that you can apply. But the key to me was one physicist told me, a theoretical physicist, he said, you know, the question is about scale. You, you cannot, you know, everything has its own scale. You have to look at things on your own scale. So you cannot apply what is going on. I mean, you can be like a, you know, great engineer and you made an amazing engine for a car, but when you drive your car, you drive your car like anybody else because you cannot, think about the combustion and, and the, all the, the little bolts there is in your engine while you're driving, you have to adapt to the scales where you are. So we have this amazing capability as humans to kind of project ourselves into the quantum scale. And these guys, that's what they do all day. They treat through mathematics, to many abstract concepts that is very difficult for, for normal humans to grab. But that's what they do. And, uh, and as an artist, I have all this possibility to go into visions and into and, and I take decision and I decide, of course. I, there's the human element in between. So I create using a mechanic. Uh, and I take decision, of course. And I don't think, well, there could be maybe a self-expressed something, but at the quantic level, it's, it's so small, so invisible. We have time for one more question, and we have to end. We have another question here, so I'm going to ask you to make a consideration final. Tem uma? Pega, só um minutinho, deixa o microfone vir porque tá gravando ali. Primeiramente, boa noite. É, a partir dessa experiência no CERN e tudo mais, é, que tipo de compreensão estética você acha que adquiriu e, e conseguiu? a partir desse, desse trabalho e desse tempo trabalhando. I think I just started, you know, um, as a Ariane Cook, the director of the program, she says when she speaks to physicists, she says when sometimes they look at art and they're like, oh, but you're not so convincing, and they say, yeah, but you know, he was there only for three months in residency. How long did you take to 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 make your experiment? And sometimes it takes them 20 years, 25 years to build the machine that you know, they want to, 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 to prove it. it took, I don't know how many years to, to put the LHC. So I think I'm just at the beginning of a process. I, I don't have the pretension to say that, you know, that's it, I, I understood everything. Or Now I'm more curious, you know, like my, I, have a, I have another project, so I'm thinking also about neuroscience. I'm interested in neuroscience. I'm interested to speak with neuroscientists because they're very inspiring. And uh, scientists, they like to speak about what they do. And uh, and so we have to take this opportunity. And, and you know, passionate people like to speak about their passion. So, uh, and they like to hear what I have to say about my passion. So, yeah, it just opened me like a new world, and, and it's very nice for me to go out of my bubble of just, you know, just the art world and, and uh, try to meet with other people, looking at things of life, but in, from a very different angle. Gente, vou pedir então só para eles fazerem uma última consideração, porque a gente tem que devolver o teatro, que amanhã tem montagem, do espetáculo que a gente apresenta aqui na terça-feira, que é o Dizemo Zieta, do João Belo, do Teatro Nora, também uma companhia suíça. É... Queria pedir então, Cláudio, uma consideração final dessa relação entre é, a arte e ciência para você, assim, na tua experiência é, pessoal, e de também falar um pouco, assim, se você tivesse que resumir numa, numa coisa, a experiência de ter se aproximado da ciência, você saiu dela com o que de diferente? É, eu acho que eu, eu queria dizer que o CERN e esse acelerador é uma colaboração mundial. As pessoas colaboram lá. Foi criado depois da Segunda Guerra Mundial para fomentar a colaboração de países que estavam devastados financeiramente e, e de, de, de guerra, né? quer dizer, de inimizades. É, Chegou a esse nível que a gente viu da, da descoberta do Higgs, acho que isso é um momento na história da civilização humana. É, realmente é um feito humano extraordinário. 
e, e são né, pessoas inteligentes, dedicadas, lá tem bastante recurso, obviamente, né, para ter esse trabalho de longo prazo e conseguir fazer isso. É, e é muito bonito ver esse trabalho gerando frutos também em artes e ver essa representação dessas ideias da física que são tão, na verdade, é, o mundo está tão estranho, a gente voltou a ter um éter ao redor da gente, tem matéria escura e a gente não sabe bem o que é. Então, a física está só começando a, a tatear em tantas coisas desconhecidas que estão aí no universo que a gente não tem explicação para elas. Então, esse aqui é um, um grande efeito da civilização humana, mas é também um grande começo dessa indagação. E é muito bonito ver esse programa de artes, de artistas em residência no CERN, dar frutos feito esse, um espetáculo tão bacana assim. Obrigado. So what, do you, what did I take from all this? I think the main thing is I speak or I think in a different way about my work. I'm like more articulated. I had to bring ideas in a different ways. And even people around me are telling me that I changed somehow, that, that I have a different approach to the work. Uh, I, I understand better the theoretical part and the, and the experimentalist. I say I'm a choreographer, I'm a theoretic theorist and an experimentalist. So I kind of understand better now the, the, the two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, I learn to learn. I understand that I need to study more. And uh, also I understand that I can study because maybe I thought that you know, my thing was art and art is like kind of more approximative. I thought it is not. So now I realize that you know I could study, I can study, but not physics, but <laughs> other things. Uh, so you know that's I think that's what I got. Yeah, the basic is this. Gente, obrigada a todo mundo que ficou nesta noite. Lá fora deve estar fresco, então né. Mas a gente vai ter que sair daqui do ar condicionado. Isso é um fato que vai acontecer, tá? Obrigada a todos.